meeting of the Cupertino City Council of May 15th, 2018. The item on our agenda is a budget study session for the upcoming fiscal year. And from staff, we have our city manager, David Brandt, here to introduce a couple of further staff members and to introduce the item. Welcome, David. Thank you. Um, and we, we have all our staff here, by the way, too, to answer questions. Um, and um, they like to sit in the audience as opposed to on the dais so that, that to play fair with one another. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, we've got um, Katie Namora and Karen Gurin who will be um, doing the line share of the pre presenting. And then we have Thomas and Zach who will um, fill in from the dais. So uh, noting for the record that uh, council members Vaidyanathan and Sharf are present as is Vice Mayor Sinks and myself um, with council member Chang uh, absent at the start of this special uh, meeting session. Perfect. Right, welcome Zach. Okay, well good afternoon, honorable mayor and council members. My name is Zach Korach, finance manager from the Department of Admin Services. Um, with me today, as David had already introduced, uh, Thomas Leung, Karen Garen and Katie Nomura, they'll be assisting in the presentation of the fiscal year 2018-19 proposed budget. Um, before we get into the presentation, I would like to offer a special thank you to continued guidance from our city manager, David Brandt, as well as all of the department heads and their staff for um, their great deal of patience and hard work in assisting the budget team in the preparation of this document that we have before you today. And as always, um, if there are any specific questions, um, department heads and staff are available for, for answering if necessary. So a brief agenda on what we'll be discussing today. Uh, first, the major accomplishments from fiscal year 17-18. We'll be going over some changes to the budget document, nothing too major. Five-year general fund forecast, general fund revenues, as well as the general fund fund balance. I'll then turn it over to Karen and Katie, who will be discussing the recommended expenditures by department. We'll also be discussing the city staffing, and we'll turn it over to Thomas, who will be discussing the issues and challenges that face the city and some of the next steps um, in the budget cycle and budget process. Finally, we'll then turn it over to Director Tim Borden, who will be discussing the capital improvement program. Okay, for the major accomplishments, um, there's a launching of the Pogo Student Carpool Pilot Program, 4th of July fireworks, Senior Center hours were expanded, Yak Attack Teen Conference, the launching of the Senior, Mo Senior Mobility Pilot uh, Ride Program, opted into the Green Prime Service for 100% renewable energy for city facilities, City Hall Landscape to a drought, uh, city, excuse me, City Hall Landscape was transformed to a drought tolerant demonstration garden, Initiated the implementation of recruitment software, establishment of a labor management committee, and finally the implementation of an asset management module. Okay, for the changes to the budget document, um, the first one we'll be discussing is the Sankey diagram. And if you wouldn't mind, yes, going directly to this diagram. The way that this has been presented in uh, previous budget documents is, again, starting with the revenue by object in the far left column, we um, this year has removed the revenue by fund. So rather than showing the type of revenue and the fund that it's originally recorded in, we're showing a various type of revenue, the revenue by object flowing directly into the fund in which those funds are expended in. Um, we found that this table or this diagram can be a bit convoluted at times and wanted to provide a um, simplified version or format for it. Department org charts and performance measures have, um, they have been consolidated um, and embedded into the department overviews within the uh, department narrative sections of the budget. GFOA recommended updates. So every year the city will submit the adopted budget to GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, um, to apply for an award for excellent reporting. Um, 
every year they will come back with, with comments, um, usually nothing minor, but um, recommended, um, recommended suggestions um, to maintain our, our budget practices are, are current and um, up, to, up to regulations. Um, and that affected various glossary terms and included a budget cycle diagram, which you'll find in the, in the published document. We've also included a 20-year forecast for the general fund. Okay. In the slide before you here, we have uh, a bar chart showing the general fund revenues, expenditures, and transfers out. Uh, and we'll start with the blue bar at the bottom. Um, this is more or less the general fund's base expenditures. These are all the expenditures excluding the transfers out and the special or the one-time special projects. And for the first four, four to five to six years, really, um, dating back to fiscal year 11, the expenditures have remained relatively consistent. Um, it wasn't until fiscal year 17 that there was a significant spike, and this is primarily due to the implementation of the cost allocation plan. Um, so the expenditures were, were increased in those years, um, followed by fiscal year 18 and 19, but again, um, Consistent with prior years, any of those cost allocation plan expenditures are offset with um, recovered revenues as well. For the next item, uh, the gray bar, we're looking at the general fund transfers out. Um, these were relatively consistent for the first three years that are being reported, um, and it wasn't until fiscal year 14 and fiscal year 15 where significant one-time dollars from Apple came into the city and were transferred out of the general fund and into the capital reserve. Since then, um, the, the, any general fund excess greater than $500,000 um, that was per city policy transferred into the capital reserve is no longer included in the budget process, but rather it's a, a year-end close mechanism. Finally, uh, the red bar, one-time special projects. Um, as it's been discussed in, in previous presentations, for those first three years, fiscal year 11 through fiscal year 13, um, any development-related special projects were not included in, this, in, in the city's budget. Um, so what that means is the dollars that were being expended by the city were not reported as, um, as appropriated expenditures in the budget document. So that was corrected in fiscal year 14, hence the, the increase in those, in those years subsequent. And for also related to special projects, if we're looking at fiscal year 18 and 19, uh, columns or the bars, um, we're going to see a slight decrease in, in those one-time special projects. This is resulting from um, the completion of Apple uh, Campus 2, now given um, its completed state, referred to as Apple Park. Um, so with less frequent one-time dollars coming in, the amount of those special projects are going to start uh, decreasing. And uh, the last piece of information on this slide would be the general fund revenues or the silver lining um, that we like to call it on this, uh, on this chart. Um, it's important to keep in mind or to note that in all of these years, except for fiscal year 15, revenues have exceeded the, the total general funds expenditures for each of those years, which would thus um, increase the general funds fund balance. This is a positive sign um, and an indication of, of a sound, um, sound structural budget. For general fund revenues, um, the story to tell here, if we're looking at fiscal year 13, 14 through uh, fiscal year 17, 18, a little bit of volatility. You're going to have swings upward and downward, um, and a lot of this is due um, or greatly related to, to Apple Park and during the completion or progression of that project. There were a lot of one-time dollars that were coming in, rolling into the sales tax um, bar or the red bar. Given the completion of the project, Looking at uh, the projections for fiscal year 18, 19, and then in the out years, we're estimating that the volatility will, will minimize. And although it, revenue numbers are decreasing from, from those record highs in 17 and 18, we are still projecting um, slight and moderate growth in those out years. Um, the other items, when I say the other items, property taxes are remaining relatively consistent um, with slow to moderate growth in those out years. TOT or TO tax um, is actually going to be experiencing a significant increase in fiscal year 18-19. 
Um, it's estimated to increase by approximately 23%. This is primarily due to the opening of the, of the Marriott, which um, opened in fall of 2017, as well as the Hyatt, which is slated to open in November of 2018. Oh, excuse me. Are we also planning to collect TOT on um, short-term rentals? Yes, I believe we are. Um, as far as the arrangement for an official development or um, short-term rental agreement with a vendor, I, I'm not aware of the current status on that, but I believe that is the city's goal. Jackie, if you want to step in and provide an update. So it's not in this proposed budget because we still haven't um, come to agreement with um, Airbnb, who we're looking into having a voluntary collection agreement with. But that is scheduled to come to council on June 5th. And after that, we can certainly make that change and incorporate it into the And, and what about budget. VRBO? Are we um, negotiating with them as well? So what we've been told is they were recently acquired by Expedia, and at this time, because of their structure, they're not um, doing VCAs. So we will continue to contact them. What they told us is they want us to check back in with them in about six months. Thank you. Oh, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Before we uh, cover the content on the on the next slide, I believe there's a conflict of interest. If Council Member Sinks wouldn't mind stepping down just for a brief moment. Sure. Thank you. Okay, for pass-through revenues uh, related to Apple Park, um, again, given the completion of the project, city staff is um, estimating uh, a significant decrease in the amount of pass-through dollars that are going to be coming um, coming through the city at $41,000. This is a decrease from the prior year of approximately $900,000. Um, we will still, of course, receive that on top 15% um, admin revenue fee. Uh, the reason why, well, I'll, I'll ask uh, council member Sinks to, to come back in and we'll explain why we wanted to call this out specifically given um, the small dollar amounts. So I apologize for having him step out so briefly, but yeah, please feel free to come back in. <laughs> so the reason why we covered um, that slide is uh, to call out or call attention to an oversight uh, that was made in the published um, document on the city's website. Um, there is on page 24 and 25 of the proposed budget, there is a table showing or illustrating all of the city's um, special projects. And unfortunately, the information or the data in that table was pulling incorrect or outdated information. Um, in some cases, it would be overstated or understated. But regardless, we wanted to present the information accurately and give everybody an idea of what this table will actually look like in the corrected, um, in, the, in, in the adopted budget. So we apologize profusely for not having caught this on the front end, and we'll ensure that, that it's corrected in, in the final budget. General fund fund balance. Um, one significant uh, point to note here is the fiscal year 17-18 estimate. Um, you'll see that the gray bar, this is consisting of all other fund balance classifications other than unassigned, so primarily our committed and assigned fund balances. Um, this is increasing to approximately $27 million and makes up of both the $19 million economic uncertainty or economic fluctuation, as well as an $8 million PERS reserve. Um, previously, that PERS reserve um, had a balance of $4.7 million. City staff is recommending the increase by an additional $3.3 million to, it arri to arrive at a total of $8 million. Um, what this $8 million PERS reserve will be used for is the initial funding for the Section 115 Trust um, or the Pension Rate Stabilization Program. I know the budget team had been, uh, we had prepared a, a brief discussion during the mid-year financial report discussing uh, the CalPERS uh, issues and, and some alternatives to, uh, to addressing the liability. Um, we have a separate item 
related to the to the actual establishment and approval of the Section 115 trust. This will be an action item that uh, Thomas Leung will be presenting this evening during the regular meeting. Uh, but as for this table and general fund fund balance in the proposed budget, it is currently reflecting that $8 million reserve. And the only other item to point out, um, during these out years, it is a good sign to see slight, um, very slight, but still, um, still uh, growth over those out years. Zach, can you just ex remind us about the trust? Uh, once we establish the trust, when and how much can we withdraw if necessary and for what purposes? Well, that's really that's one of the, the primary benefits of establishing this trust rather than um, it's acting as a diversification for our investment portfolio mm -hmm. as it relates directly to the pension liability in our pension plan assets. Um, by, by not funding it directly to CalPERS and establishing this separate trust, we have a lot more control or discretion as to when we want to use those funds. But I do want to emphasize that any, any funds that are sent directly to that trust, they must be used to either reimburse the city for those pension costs or um, be sent directly to CalPERS. And also the investments thereof. If they, if, if they do some investments and we have an interest, we can use those too. Does Correct. it come back to us? I'm sorry, do you uh, mind you, clarifying? Uh, you said that when the trust is established, uh, they could... If, if, we, if we had that money, our, our investment, our audit committee would look into uh, having, some, having it invested and we would get whatever is the going market rate. But this is going to be very different. This trust would be established and not in our control anymore. So... <clears throat> just not, the investment policy will be under our control, although there's some limits. We obviously can't invest in junk bonds, but um, <laughs> the idea is that... Um, we can use the money in this trust for any um, pension-related expense, you know, be it to reimburse PERS or to supplement PERS or to... So essentially if we have, um, you know, let's say we have a downturn, we can supplement what we would have normally budgeted for, you know, PERS expense and pull the money out of the trust instead, thereby freeing up that otherwise, you know, that general fund money for what else we need. And the investment income too. That, that yeah, and that, that goes into the trust, and it's we can spend it for the okay. same purpose. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Recommended expenditures in the general fund for fiscal year eighteen nineteen. Um, staff propose an amount of seventy seven point five million dollars. Um, this chart before you breaks out the total seventy seven point five million by department. Um, in total, this is an increase of approximately $2.4 million over the prior year's adopted budget, or 3% higher. And we'll be going into more detail um, what's making up those, those specific changes. And for the city as a whole, if we're looking at all of the, all the city funds, both governmental and proprietary, um, total recommended expenditures is $131.4 million. Uh, it's important to note that this is actually a decrease of $17.5 million or 12% from the prior year's adopted budget. And again, we'll be covering, covering these changes in just a few slides, I promise. Here we go. So the changes from prior year's adopted budget. Um, as far as the employee compensation and benefits, staff is recommending an increase of approximately $2.2 .2 million. Um, the increase is resulting from, from natural step progression um, from reclassifications, cost of living adjustments, um, and it is also, it should be noted that within this increase, um, the, the addition of three brand new positions is also included in the proposed budget. We have a slide dedicated to this and we'll be discussing those positions um, in great detail. For materials and contract services, those are slated to increase approximately $500,000 and $900,000 respectively, and the um, Reason for those increases is primarily related to um, innovation and technology as it consolidates software costs for various departments. Cost allocation um, is increasing $1.5 million. This is primarily due to a change in methodology um, for INT charges moving from a per user to a per device basis. I know that this is probably not the first time that you've heard of this change in methodology, um, but given um, the procedures to complete the, the cost allocation plan model, um, it takes into, the, takes into account those previous methodology changes. Um, and for, 
for 1819, it did um, take those into account and that stood out as one of the largest changes still. For capital outlays and special projects, this is actually decreasing approximately $13.5 million, uh, primarily due to significant progress and or completion of various capital projects in fiscal year 1718. Um, contingencies, this is decreasing $300,000. Uh, this is a decrease from 8% to 5% of the total material and supplies budget. Um, the reason for this reduction in in the determination for these contingency balances was to better match the actual use of these of these contingency budget funds. Debt service remains re relatively unchanged. These are fixed amounts from year to year based on the debt agreement. Transfers out is decreasing approximately $8.9 million, primarily due to the decrease in uh, capital spending and also due to a reduction in um, the amount of subsidies provided to um, internal service funds. This is also related to the consolidation from uh, the city's web channel to the general fund. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen Guerin, who will begin discussing the department narrative budgets. Good afternoon, Mayor Paul and council members. The council and commission's budget is proposed to increase um, about $45,000. Salary and benefits is showing an increase due to the um, change of staffing for the Public Safety Commission. It was with the Sheriff, the Sheriff's Department used to staff the Public Safety Commission, now it'll be the City Manager's Office. And this also takes an account, into account negotiated uh, salary and benefit increases. Materials is proposed to increase due to conference and meeting costs for the commissioners and also uh, team commission events like their pizza and politics, which happens every other year, and their Hack Cupertino event. Contract services is showing a slight increase. Um, we've had some uh, increased requests in community funding, but this is also, that this contract services is offset by a decrease in contract services for the team commission and the planning commission. Cost allocation is showing a reduction. Uh, basically, as um, uh, Manager Korak said, the change in methodology for cap cost allocation, and this is offset by an increase in one-time IT project and expenses and services provided by finance and HR. Uh, contingencies are going down due to the increase, the decrease in the percentage from 8 to 5 percent of materials and contracts. These are the community funding requests. We've asked the organizations to be here today to speak specifically to their requests, but I'll give you um, an overview here. Um, the Friends of Deer, Ho Deer Hollow Farm is requesting $15,000 and they would like to replace the barn, wooden gates, and install some new signage. The Cupertino Historical Society is proposing a $20,000 um, request and th it's for their continued exhibits and they, they like the funds to also help them organize, catalog, and consolidate their collection. The Euphrat Museum is asking for $15,000 for their exhibits and outreach programs so they can offer one-of-a-kind of one exhibits, events, and programs. The Rotary is asking for $12,000 for their health, safety, and environmental activities at the Fall Festival. The Iranian Federated Women's Club is asking for $5,000 for their winter solstice, solstice event in December. And two new requests, the Korean American Community Services, which they provide social, health, cultural, and educational services for Korean American seniors that live in Santa Clara County. They're proposing health promotion and education activities to improve the overall uh, quality of life for Cupertino senior residents, and they're requesting uh, $5,000. And then the Bayshore Lyric Opera, they're proposing a free outdoor family-friendly friend opera performance. Um, this request originally came in at $1,500, and they had some technical, technical difficulties when they submitted their application, so they were granted an extension. And when they resubmitted their request, it came in at $3,750. So the actual total of the request would be $75,750. The administration budget is proposing to increase about $659,000. Salary and benefits is showing an increase due to the um, salary and benefit increases that are slated for um, <coughs> July 1st, and also the addition of a risk manager, and the conversion of a limited term environmental programs assistant to full time, the reallocation of staff, and, uh, and the reallocation of budget. 
contract services is showing a decrease due to the city attorney's office re reduced, reduced their contract services in order to fund their senior assistant city attorney position in salary and benefits. And also this is offset by an increase in election costs. Materials is showing a slight increase due to printing and duplicating general supplies and electric election materials. Cost allocation is showing an increase due to uh, the change in methodology for calculating IT charges. And also this is offset by decreases for facility charges. Special projects is showing an increase uh, due to some sustainability projects and fixed assets acquisition. Contingencies is showing an increase. Um, the city manager's contingency is 5% of the total general fund material and contracts budget. So this increase is reflected here and it's slightly offset by a decrease um, in the other contingencies budgets decreasing. Here are the special projects for administration. They total nearly $242,000. The residential drought tolerant landscaping pilot program, the residential energy reduction and efficiency program, the utility box art painting, and employee commute program. Law enforcement is proposed to increase um, nearly $641,000. This is basically due to increased contract costs due to changes associated with total compensation and retirement rate increases. Innovation and technology is proposed to increase nearly $399,000 and this is, due, um, this is due to salary and benefits increasing, increasing due to the reallocation of staff cost allocation changes um, as far as one-time IT project expenses, the change in methodology for IT charges, and the cost of services provided to other departments. Materials is increasing due to the acquisition of software, um, equipment, and supplies. Contract services is showing an increase due to um, large, large projects within the applications and GIS uh, divisions and the maintenance of equipment. Special projects is showing a significant reduction due to the completion of large projects. The contingencies are reducing also because of uh, the percentage is reducing from 8% to 5%. And then other financing uses, as you recall, the video department was moved out of the ISF department to the general fund, so we do not budget for depreciation in the internal service fund, so this decrease is for that reason. These are the special projects in IT, the hyperconverge, which is an expansion of uh, storage and memory for the servers. The multifunctional replacement is the second um, project. The wireless upgrade for city facilities um, is the third project. And public access around city facilities is the hotspots. And then video storage for the video division is the last um, project for a total of 365,000. Admin services budget is proposing to increase about $812,000. Salary and benefits are proposed to increase due to the negotiated salary and benefit increases, but also for the, a request for a limited term senior management analyst. And also at mid-year, um, an account clerk one and two was added. We're also, what's also included in this category is part-time costs and retiree health benefits, which are increasing. Contract services is showing um, an increase due to short-term uh, disability costs included in this program budget and uh, also the addition of additional liability insurance purchased by the city. And also at mid-year, um, uh, funding was approved for the outsourcing of the treasury investment function, so this is also included in this category. Cost allocation is showing an increase due to one-time um, IT project expenses, expenses and changes in allocation method for IT charges. And contingencies are showing a reduction for the same reason uh, from going from 8% to 5% of materials and contracts. Well, I had a question about law enforcement. Sure. Um, I didn't want to interrupt you while you were talking, but okay. are we getting any additional officers for that extra $640,000? It's just I see and how many deputies do we have now that are assigned to Cupertino I see okay thank you 
Well, I have a number of questions and comments too. I'm just wondering what the pleasure of the council is with and staff with respect to what we, you know, do we get through this in the entire admin section and then talk about that or what do you suggest? Mr. Manager, is your mic on? I'm sorry. Um, we have this teed up. We can start and stop it at your pleasure. So if you want to ask questions, whenever is convenient. We're still piling through all the admin stuff, right? We're moving on to recreation next. Yeah. Do you have a, when an you're estimate? done with admin, let me know. Okay. Uh, do you have an estimate of how long the entire presentation would take, Karen? About 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Okay. If we, if we go straight through. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And so admin will be another few minutes, I take it? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm done with administration and uh, administrative services um, and recreation's coming up next. Okay, yeah. great. Well, this is probably a good stopping point for admin questions then. Sure. Uh, Vice Mayor Sings. Yeah, so um, I have a, a few requests for to, to prep us as we go into the actual hearings, right? This is a study session, so we're not voting on anything, just sort of asking questions and that's the idea of today, right? Mm -hmm. Asking yeah. for more data so we can make more informed decisions later. So um, I note that city manager department increases in this budget from 3.37 to 4.62 full-time equivalents. That's a big increase. Um, city attorney budget also at five. I, I would appreciate an assessment of you know, if I think about these as, I, I sort of think of these as related, right? And you can make risk management decisions out of the city manager's office. You could do them from the city attorney's office. But I think overall, I would like to take the risk manager position, which I understand may be a separate position outside the attorney's office in some cities, and then look at the attorney function and have us compare our cost efficiency, and I know there are various metrics to do it. One is the cost per employee, right? Mm -hmm. um, cost per em person employed by the city as one metric, but whatever you think are appropriate metrics and stack us up against the other 15 cities in the county, or at least the ones for which we can actually get some data that you know are, are comps for us, I would say. Because I'm, I'm thinking uh, w w the, this council voted last year to increase CA office. I'm, and you know, at the time I was concerned about costs. If we're adding yet one more position uh, in this general area, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, I would also, I mean, I for one would be interested in, you know, free, freezing positions that we have here now to see what we might do next. In other words, not, uh, not hiring at this time. Uh, for those so we can get this overall assessment done. And I'm expecting what, if we have our budget hearing a month or so from now, we're not, I'm not asking for much of a, a time, but I think it would be appropriate for us to, to look at all of this in context. Um, so that would be my request. Sure. Yeah, we can, we can um, do that analysis for you. And then um, similarly, I note that, I mean, it's coming in another department, but. But likewise, I'd like to see how we're doing on efficiency and performance um, as we propose to make one uh, limited term worker permanent in, in public works. I know we're not there yet, but I'll just make this comment now. I, I'd like to see a similar comparison on whatever basis, you know, an objective analysis. Um, how are we doing with the amount of staffing we have? We have an ambitious bike plan. We'd like to do more regionally with transit, but I'd like to see uh, before we, you know, make another staffing, new staffing decision there, I'd like to see how we're performing there. And I've spoken with Tim uh, briefly about that as well. Um, did I hear you say that instead of the sheriff staffing our public safety, public safety commission, they're no longer willing to do that or what? Yeah, so um, th they, just to be clear, they, they come to every meeting and they're prepared, but what they have asked us to take over is the prepare, preparation of the agenda, noticing the meeting. They were doing all of the admin level stuff as well. So um, 
Oh, they were noticing the meetings and everything? Well, through the clerk's office, but they were preparing the agendas and they were doing what would be typically staff work and, you know, not to say bad things about cops, but that's not really what their skill set generally is. Well, okay. I mean, I, I, I mentioned this before, but I would be interested in, again in, you know, it, it's not only about the money, but it's about responsibility, about thinking about how much money could we, since this is a budget hearing, I'll repeat the request this way, if we consolidated public safety, library, and parks and rec into one commission, what would that do for our, our budget? I mean, how much money would we save to do that? We I'm not asking for that now, but. Yeah, no, we can do that. I mean, that's not a terribly just, difficult calculation. Especially if the sheriff isn't, I mean, I don't know yeah. what it means, but I just kind of wonder if we might be, we might have better discussions uh, if we had more of a focus to this thing, you know, incorporate seniors as well, right? I know we have a separate thing that we spun out, but I mean, I think all those those aspects could neatly fall into um, reckon. Uh, well, frankly, what the department is called, right? Reckon Community Services, which has responsibility for those things. So, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in that. And I guess that concludes my questions for this section my requests uh, I, I just want to vocalize um, a, a question regarding vice mayor Sinks' uh, last comment I, I, I'm not sure and this is just a comment on that I mean with regard to uh, budgetary considerations I, I don't know what consolidating those three commissions would necessarily do for our our cost expenditures it, it seems like relatively speaking um, council and commissions are uh, a fairly minor part of the overall budget and I would imagine that those three are, are similarly um, you know, not similarly but but correspondingly even more of a minor portion of the overall budget um, so and, and I also wouldn't agree with uh, consolidating those uh, those three commissions into one so I just, just want to put that on the record um, not to not to give you, you know, a disparity of direction in terms of you know what to analyze. Certainly, please go forth and analyze it. But um, you know, personally, I think that public safety, parks and rec, and libraries serve pretty different functions with regard to um, you know uh, us getting some input from the public. So I have one more question, I guess, and that is: Are are we hearing from these? This is the section where we would hear from community groups, or is that in the follow-on section? Um, if the groups are here today, are they are we giving them an opportunity to present or and ask questions of them, or what? Typically, if the council's interested in that, we we can call them up. I mean, we did. They're in this part of the budget, so they are. The, so I'm I'm certainly interested in hearing the pitches. Okay. Uh, sure. Before before we invite them, I had just a follow up question. I, I I asked my questions ahead of time, and I got one response by email. So thank you to the budget team for that. But I just have one clarification. Sure, Council Member Vadim. Uh, so this is about the drought tolerant landscape pilot program, and uh, from what I understand, the program will leverage the water district turf removal rebate program. Do we know if it's a one to one? Um, what's the ratio? If uh, public works can or environmental. Hi, Misty Marsich, Sustainability Manager. Um, so we're talking with the Water District about exactly what that will look like. They currently run a program called Lawn Busters, which is currently for low-income seniors veterans, and it's um, a landscape design program where they'll help you design a new la drought-tolerant landscape while also removing your turf, so it kind of helps. It's kind of an all-in-one turnkey approach. Um, our proposal is to do something similar for Cupertino residents, open to all Cupertino residents, obviously figure out um, the details on what that will be, how much that will cost residents, and all of that. Um, but the idea is to leverage, with the, their current Lawn Busters program, they do leverage the landscape rebate program, the, um, where you get a, the dollar per square foot, or Cupertino residents get $2 per square foot, per square foot removed. Um, and so we'll be talking to them about how to leverage that money that we've already have in there um, to help help with this program. So we would not be duplicating efforts, and it would be kind of a supplemental program that um, kind of goes a step beyond what is already exists. So what is the 175,000 based on prior history? Is that what we typically do? 
Uh, it's based on uh, an, an estimation of the number of square feet that we would remove and the number of homes that we would um, be able to provide this service for. And the water district, you're working with the water district? Yes, we're in that. conversations with them. Um, they currently use a nonprofit provider for their current Lawn Busters program. Not sure if that model will work here in Cupertino. We're talking with them also. So we're kind of exploring different options to try to bring the, the model of that type of a program here. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. You're welcome. Could I just follow up mm -hmm. on that? So would another way for this to be budget, for, for us to budget a certain amount of administration cost where we pay that that administration cost to whoever the provider is, but then if, if we're providing an all-in-one service, which I think is a terrific idea, I think it's a great idea because, I mean, my frustr I'd, I'd done this program and I stalled halfway through because, you know, first you get, you have to wait two months for somebody to come out or three months or four months or whatever it is, and then you get to, you get the, the person there, they measure it all out, and then you have to apply with that information, and then you have to get a landscape architect, and then you have to get somebody to implement, and finally you have to do all this validation. So, you know, you're now talking to half a dozen people in the end, trying to put all this together, and I think it's just so onerous that it may, if doing something turnkey would be great. In other words, you make an appointment, sure, it may take a couple months for somebody to show up, but then somebody measures it out and says, okay, you have this many square feet, here's what it would cost you, net of the rebates that are available, right? Mm -hmm. And then you look in the book and pick one of six designs and you say, I'm willing to do that. And if you're willing to do sort of a can design, then you actually would get this thing done. They would be responsible for fulfilling it all, I assume, right? Yes. Our administrator. But you, because we're bringing so much business, presumably we'd get a, you'd get a much better rate and you'd get a package thing going. Is that the idea? Yes, that's exactly the idea. And I've heard um, from other residents too about how frustrating the process is and how they just don't really know what to do. They want to they want a drought tolerant landscaping, but they're kind of stuck on on what to do. So we do want to provide an, an easy approach for residents and and for all residents. Also, the current program that the water district has, you know, a lot of. Um, the projects that they're doing are in San Jose and not that many are here in Cupertino. So we want to make sure that residents can use the, the water districts program and then also we can provide something for all residents. So you think you could work out a deal where you could automatically get the rebate handled through this administrator. Residents wouldn't have to have a separate process with the Santa Clara Valley Water District. We would just have a turnkey thing that would, would give a price um, based on square footage converted or something. Yeah, I, I hope that we can take leverage that rebate, the per square foot dollar amount, put that towards the project, and then the resident would pay an amount in, in, on top of that. That would be the all I'd, all I'd like you to think about now for budgeting purposes is it might be just OK for us to say, we're not putting in more than we did in prior years, or, or maybe we're not even doing that. We're going to cover the ad admin of this, which is the complex part. Mm -hmm. We're going to go contract with these services. We're going to apply the Santa Clara Valley Water District rebate. But then, you know, based on the fact that we're getting a bulk rate here for these services, hopefully, maybe not in this labor climate, I don't know, right? But, you know, I would love to just say, have somebody come to my house once, point to that in the book, sign here, and then in one or two months later, right, suddenly have a new drip irrigation front lawn, I mean, I'd be down on that. I think a lot of residents would do this. And I, you know, we're entering, we know this, uh, that we're gonna have droughts again in California increasingly, right? So doing all we can in these years to, to um, convert, I think just makes wonderful sense. So I really appreciate Thank your you. initiative. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Any other questions on admin? If not, we'll, let's go for to Parks and Rec, I think you mentioned was the next session. Are we, are we giving the applicants for community grants a chance to come up? Uh, sure. Are there any applicants for the community grants uh, here today who would like to? Uh, I see two hands raised. Okay. Uh, feel free to come on up. Um, I'm assuming we have the Historical Society here as well as uh, another uh, representative. So... 
uh, feel free to, to come up and uh, give a summary of the project uh, that's being proposed or the funds and their proposed usage. Thanks very much. Welcome. Is that good? So my, my yard's extremely doubt tolerant. It dried, died during the drought, and I haven't replaced it. <laughs> I'm Park Chamberlain. I'm on the board of the Friends of Deer Hollow Farm. I, did, I didn't bring a formal presentation. I, I didn't know that one was needed. So I'll just summarize the three projects that we have that compose the $15,000 in the uh, in our request from the city. Uh, the largest, uh, more than two thirds, uh, over $10,000, is to replace a small barn with a large uh, tough shed. Uh, the barn in question was kind of put together over the years um, on an ad hoc basis. Um, it doesn't have a good foundation and the original various repairs that were made are kind of all falling apart slowly. To so when the farm staff wants to replace that with an improved foundation and a large plastic, a heavy plastic tough shed that'll serve the same purpose and be a drier and won't require a, nearly as much maintenance. Um, the other two projects uh, comprising about 4,500 together. Uh, one of them is for uh, new gates. Uh, the farm has lots of fences. Uh, that means lots of gates. Uh, some of the gates have been replaced with modern metal gates, but many of the others haven't, and so we just like to pick up all the others. And a very straightforward project. And uh, finally, there's a project for some uh, signs in the orchard. Uh, the, the farm has a large orchard. Um, would like to start using it in the educational projects, and that means uh, putting up some signage to explain what's going on. Uh, there really isn't any signage. If you don't know how to recognize a persimmon tree now, uh, there's nothing that would help you out. <laughs> and so that's, that's the third project. Uh, that's really all there is to it. And I welcome any questions. Great, thank you, Park. Are there any questions from our council? Council Member Sharp. Oh, what were the projects you did last year with the 15,000? I don't recall all of them just sitting here, but the I do remember the major one. Uh, it was uh, what you might call a refurbishment of the workshop there. As you walk into the farm, right across from you, if you know the farm, there is a large uh, workshop where all kinds of repair projects take place and a lot of the equipment, sm small equipment is stored. And it was in bad shape, it had a rodent problem and it needed a lot of work in the interior, so that the major project was that. And I believe that's pretty much done at this point. And you, did you say the tough shed is plastic? I thought those were wood. I could be wrong. Uh, the one I have at home is a heavy duty plastic, but maybe they're not all heavy duty plastic. It's what the mid pen wants in terms of weather, um, what they think will be best up there. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks. Any further questions? Yeah. Council Member, yeah. like nothing. In a year, how many uh, visitors do you get, and do you get classrooms, uh, kids? Um, so there are classes. I, I don't have a number for you to standing here, but essentially, as you know, there are environmental education classes, and they run throughout the school year, uh, four days a week. Uh, covering the city of Mountain View and all, pretty much all of Santa Clara County. Um, it's a fairly large program. And Fridays are reserved for rainouts and postponements. And as I understand it from the city, um, every, every viable slot, every, every slot they have for a class is taken. So it's and, a countywide program? Uh, yes, it's run by Mountain View and, of course, the, as you probably know, Mountain View runs the farm. It's part of it, although Mid Peninsula Open Space District owns the land underneath the farm. And so Mountain View um, has a program where they, they naturally favor uh, schools within Mountain View. And then they have a program whereby schools in the rest of the county uh, can apply and there's a lottery system. 
do you have, do you know offhand how much they fund? How much they fund? Um, they fund two and a half headcount. That's their major expense, and also a fair number of incidentals. Okay, thank you. But, uh, Very good. good. Uh, Vice Mayor Sinks. Yeah, so my questions run along Savita's as well. Um, is the, could you provide this data to uh, city staff as we evaluate all of these community proposals? Um, I believe it was, a certain amount of it was in the proposal, uh, which went to city staff. Uh, that's why I'm here today. Well, I'm, I'm reading it and I didn't get any numbers. And I'm particularly interested in Cupertino resident served and, the, you know, if, if we take a look at the uh, money we're putting in to any of these programs, and I'm not picking on yours, money we're putting into these programs divided by uh, residents served and, and the value they're getting, that's kind of, that, those are the kind of metrics I'm looking for, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in, in some cities there isn't any, there are, are none of these things, and I appreciate that there could be benefit here, uh, but I'd, I really would like to see, um, since we're using, since we would allocate presumably taxpayer dollars to do this from the general fund, what bang we're getting for the buck, uh, and uh, and then the specific benefit, right? So, wh who's being served, and how many, and what they're getting. So, that would be my request to you, sir. All right, fine. I, we have a survey taken a few years ago in which people stood at the gates of the farm and asked for zip codes. Is everybody who came by? Um, I'll provide the numbers to the people I provided the original grant request to. Yeah, but it's, it sounds like you also have stu school classes come in, right? Yeah, we have, I have, we have complete statistics on that. I'll provide them too. I think that would be terrific. Because it, it does sound like uh, there could be quite a number of school classes, but frankly, from where we sit, right, we're, this is a little, in, it's not, um, at this budgeting time of year where we're setting priorities, uh, it, it's a good time to remind us or tell us uh, and have you make your case. So. Through city staff, I'd, I'd ask that you provide that data. Thank you. Certainly. All right. Thank you, Park. Karen, can I ask you a question? Councilmember Chang. Yes, go ahead. Uh, on the community funding request, mm -hmm. Bishop Lyric Opera, you see it will be, instead of 1,500, it will be 7,500 uh, roughly? 30, 3,750. 37. It went from 1,500 to 3,750, the okay. request. And then what kind of performance, and then where are they going to perform? They, on their uh, request, they're yeah. proposing do, doing their performance at Memorial Park, but okay. I have no indication that they reached out to the Parks and Rec Department to discuss that. There, there'll be a three performance. It looks like it's just one performance based on the proposal. Okay. And then I don't see any friendships, cities, uh, Budget here. So, am I missing somewhere? We did not get a community funding request for a friendship city. I thought last time we had. No, I'm, I could be wrong. David? No, they came no. in separately. And separate, separate budget item. No, no, they came in. They came in off budget, so they came in. I can't remember what it was. It was. Um, in the spring, so they they never were part of the budget process. Oh, okay, thank you. I was wondering if we had more in this community funding category that wanted to speak. Can I speak? Uh, yes, please, uh, Helene Davis from the Historical Society, welcome. Um, actually, I am Helene Davis and I'm with the Rotary, Rotary? Club of okay, Cupertino. Um, so I'm gonna try and articulate this because I'm new to this. Um, so I'm president-elect of Cupertino Rotary and the funding is for the Fall Fest. And my understanding is that you have uh, given us funding in the past. Last year it was $12,000. And I have an email here from Oren, who's really kind of the, the champion and the pro, and he knows all the information. But supposedly the city has provided funds because there are two components. There's a safety fair and an environmental fair that are components of the Fall Festival. And this is a citywide community uh, festival. It's for all uh, com uh, community members. And so we're asking for the 12,000 again this year that you gave us last year. But 
So I'll answer any questions that I can, but like I said, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this because I'm new to the Fall Fest. Okay, I have a question. So mm -hmm. last year we were discussing the funding of these festivals. It was pointed out the Fall Festival attendance has been continuously falling. Um, and we did have a safety booths at the uh, Earth Day Festival, so I'm just wondering if this, you know, should we be spending this money year after year to reach a decreasing number of people each year? I remember the Fall Festival used to be two days. It was mm -hmm. Oktoberfest, I think it used to be. And now it seems it's much smaller. Um, you know, a bunch of insurance companies and cable companies trying to sell things. Um, I just wonder if, you know, that festival, you know, is, is worth us spending all this money on uh, year after year? Well, I think that's something you'll have to answer. Um, these are questions that we ask ourselves, too, and you're right, it has morphed over time. It was Oktoberfest, and then it was the, uh, the Jubilee, the 50th anniversary, and then it sort of morphed into the Fall Fest. Uh, we still feel that it's viable, at least for the next few years. Um, you're right that it used to be two days and then went to one day. Uh, but we still feel like it's fairly well attended, and there is uh, these components uh, of the Fall Fest. Um, and that we would actually ask a lot of the people that, that attended the Earth Day, the, the booths that were there, we'd like them to be a part of the Fall Fest because um, my understanding that that was pretty well attended. And it's an important draw in our community. Earth Day, Earth Day was packed. Yes, um, it, was, it was a good yeah. event. It was a great event, and we're going to ask a lot of those folks to come and, and participate in the Fall Fest. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, we could just have numbers from the Fall Fest, how many attendees that would help. And if I remember, there were city staff that were uh, staffing the booths, so we could probably collect some information from them too. Because I did see a lot of kids uh, that went to these, uh, both the environment booth as well as the safety booths. Uh, so it would be nice to collect that information and give it to us. Okay, I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can find that information for you and send it yeah, on. Yeah, to we you. actually have Thank estimates you. for the festival. We can actually bring a slide up. Yeah, uh, uh, we estimate about three thousand to five thousand uh, attendees at the fall festival. And, and in comparison to the Earth Day. Yeah, can you say again? The Earth Day. Uh, about yeah, we don't, seven thousand. Yeah, we don't actually have, uh, but yeah, about. It'd be about That's not what I'm. Yeah, it would be okay. great to see Cherry Blossom, Earth yeah, Day, a, all, all of them in a comparison so we can see. We have a slide. Okay, oh, okay. Okay, you have a slide coming up. Rec, okay. right? Thank you, okay. We're going to so talk about festivals. Festivals are in parks and recreation right. or recreation yes. community services. Okay, thank you. Do we have anybody else? It didn't look like it. Are there any other organizations here um, applying for funding requests in this budget cycle? Karen? Okay. Yes. Kids, Pray, uh, Kids Pray Festival. Did they apply? Who? Kids Pray. So festival? the festivals yeah. will be mm -hmm. in a separate section. They'll be in a separate. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So, so should we discuss some of the other ones with the people that are not here? I mean, the Iranian um, Women's Club went from four hundred to five thousand dollars. That that's quite an increase. Um, yes. I wonder what the money is for. Well, I think it's to pay for a dinner that they throw. They're looking but to that, fund 100% of their event, their winter solstice event in December. Oh, okay, because I thought we, last time the dinner was not free, we had to pay for that dinner. No? So they want the dinner to... Yes, that's no. right. Do we pay? Somebody paid, whether attendees it was not us paid. or the city, somebody paid for us. Um, well, I thought the dinner was here, inside here. It was, but, yeah, yeah, it I mean, was, for but the food. it's their private event that we're subsidizing. Oh. oh. And the question pay? is whether we ought to be doing that. Right, I think it was like $35 a person for the, I, I can't remember exactly, okay. but yeah, I mean, that seems. Chris, you do a doing a good job for me. Thank you, appreciate it. I mean, it was, a, let me say it was a great festival and the food was really good, but um, yeah. that's, you know. So if we give them $4,000, then we can get a free meal? Well, everyone in the city could get a free meal. Are right? you sure? I, I don't know <laughs> if this is what we really want to be doing, but. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I I actually think this is this whole list has gotten out of hand. I mean, we have all these organizations that come into council at this time of year looking for money. And quite frankly, right, I think it would be more responsible for us to send them all to 
our professional staff who are charged with administering all these programs in the community, and that would be our, you know, Department of Recreation and Community Services. So how do we evaluate whether we have somebody doing performing opera or somebody doing Shakespeare or whatever they're doing, right? I think as part of the programming for any monies that the city has to expend to the extent that we're, you know, we're taking substantial general funds, I think we ought to let our professional staff weigh these against other things. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. I think, I think this list ought to get, okay, I'll use this fancy engineering term from a long time ago, homologated into um, Parks and Rec. And it's not like some of these things might not be worthy, but I mean, for me to vote for any of these things, I'm sure interested in a professional evaluation of how many people are we serving? Can they afford to pay on their own? If it's a dinner, you know, for a, a cultural group, um, I got to really scratch my head and wonder if it's a good use of, of taxpayer money to basically subsidize the whole thing. As, as valuable as it is, you know, what, we, what every one of these organizations has to think about is we're taking taxpayer dollars to fund benefits. And, and you know, my question and my, my, my direction to staff for when we, we hear these things finally, I mean, I don't know where people are on this, but I'd sure love to see uh, performance metrics, which is frankly right what I would expect um, uh, uh, rec and community services as professionals to be able to evaluate by more thorough and rigorous screening and then saying, okay, well, we already have one of these, but we need three more of these things. And what I don't want to do is inhibit new ideas from coming in. So the incumbent groups that get grant money year after year, that may be okay, but we actually may want to be making room for, for new cultural things in the city. But with this process, I find it all pretty clumsy. We've had only two of the groups show up here today. And I, you know, I don't think this is how we ought to be, how, to, how we ought to be running this for what it's worth. For any of the organizations, and including the Rotary Club that I'm associated with. I agree with you. I, I think this should be done by the uh, Park and Recreation Department to evaluate and then do it. And then, but I disagree with you. This is a substantial amount. I mean, twenty-one thousand dollars in compar in comparison of the whole budget. I mean, I don't think this is a big. Well, it's not. No, no, that's an increase of twenty-one altogether. It's it's seventy-five thousand dollars. I'm, I'm right? looking at community funding required. Even seventy-five thousand, I, I still don't think is is such a. No, it's, it's, but then I mean you're right. It's just uh, it a should be process yeah, for it. It's, the, the process. Uh, I would like to know too. You know how many people attend, what kind of e effect. So if you can can do some screening and work, because for us to sit here to discuss, you know, five thousand dollar, three thousand dollar, out of hundred thirty four million dollar budget, you just waste our time, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I just wonder, do we, did these organizations just happen to come and seek money? Do we yes. outreach to other organizations and say, hey, why don't you come and ask us for money and we'll evaluate all the requests against each other? This, this just seems to be year after year after year, the same groups coming back expecting this funding. And, you know, frankly, I look at some of them and, you know, I, I wouldn't even give them any money on some of them. But... Actually, there are two new groups, and I was I wanted to hear a little bit more about the two new groups. If do we have any more information? I, I know the applicants are not here, but the Korean American Community Services and the Bayshore Lyric Opera are they based in Cupertino? Let and, me let me look up that. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't believe either one of them are. Okay, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we are already past four thirty. But if we could have all this information sent to us, that would be great. Okay. Right. I mean, we don't need to evaluate this on the fly or, you know, pull out no. your laptop or iPad. But okay. in terms of um, a, a process, it does make sense. We do have a process, right? Um, these applications are supposed to be filled out, I believe, by the end of March. Is that correct? And there's a form for it. Yeah. And they, um, these people but, filled, the, they, they filled the application out. Right, right. I, and so, I mean, there are funding requests that come in after that deadline. Um, there's a certain standard of expectation. Um, by the people that are applying. 
um, we do have the discretion to, to grant or uh, reject funding applicants. Um, but I, I, I hear what the rest of uh, my colleagues on council are saying in the sense that we would like to have staff go back and you know, evaluate using certain metrics, things like how many people are affected in Cupertino, um, you know, what would be the you know, price per you know, benefited resident, for instance. Um, I, I think that's a reasonable request in terms of um, you know, trying to see whether these funding uh, requests are, uh, are, are um, grantable, I, I guess. And uh, we do the same thing for any other request that comes in. We do ask staff to evaluate and give a recommendation one way or the other. Um, so, you know, given the fact that we're not making any budgetary decisions tonight, uh, perhaps there's some time to go ahead and go back and run those evaluations and, you know, make some kind of recommendation. Um, but given the fact that we do have a process in place and we have asked people to, you know, fill out an application by a, a date certain, um, you know, personally, I don't have an issue with, you know, assigning this to a particular department or uh, a staff member. Um, but I think there is a certain expectation in terms of, um, you know, a, a general process, even though it could be refined a bit. So, yeah, I mean, a, a, another option would be, um, and I don't know if we talked about this before, but to set flat budget amounts for, like, say, you know, $100,000 to support festivals and, you know, $50,000 to support community grants. Um, currently, the way we do it, it just sort of invites more and more people to come and ask for more right, money, whatever right. they want to ask for, right? right. And, and frankly, right, the <laughs> year after year, we've been saying to applicants, how many people are you serving? We're, the quality of the the data in these applications doesn't really allow us to do this. And I just think, I mean, honestly, we'd be better off having professional staff. I like the idea of saying, okay, let's find the most cost efficient festivals, set a budget amount for them, I mean, we're going to get to festivals, but mm -hmm. I, I rather like that idea, right? So I know when I've been to the Wafu Ikebana Festival, it attracts thousands of people. I mean, it costs a lot, but there's a big impact. But I think starting to, to put some metrics on, um, you know, for the money that we're putting in that are taxpayers' dollars, you know, how well are we doing? I mean, Diwali is another one of those, right, uh, that, that draws a lot of people very popular. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm getting ahead of this because sure. you're, you're coming, coming to festivals, so yeah. sorry, I'll stop now. Right, and uh, we're about 4.40 right now. I'm going to take a five-minute break. This is going to be a fast five minutes, so we'll reconvene at, at 4.45.
convene. We have uh, one question regarding admin before we pick it up again with regard to uh, Parks and Rec. So, uh, Council Thank Member Vaidyanathan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question is for Bill. Uh, if we could bring up that slide. The special projects. The special projects IT. Thank you so much. Uh, one couple of questions on this uh, before my main question. The public wireless hotspots, we have a closed session item later today. Is it in connection with that or is this separate? Uh, Mayor, Council Member uh, this is a separate entity. The closed session today discusses uh, private public uh, partnership dealing with a carrier. Okay. This one is our own Wi Fi hotspots that the city themselves will control. And depending on how that goes, would one eliminate the other or would they still go in parallel? No, they would be in conjunction with each other. Okay. They could uh, replace each other in the future, but for right now, they'll be in parallel. Okay, thank you. And then my main question is what is hyperconverged? So, hyperconverged infrastructure is normally in a data center, you have a server segment, you have a network segment, and a storage segment that ties all of those together. A new platform is called hyperconvergence that takes all three of those components and puts them into an appliance itself. So your server, your storage, and your network for that server storage environment is all within one appliance. So that's what we're talking about there. So I have two questions because I understood by, from the term converge, the right. general English term. So two questions. One is, do we have a backup because we recently had an issue? And the second thing, what is the risk? Okay, the risk to this, because it, it is a new but very well-tested uh, environment, and we've already had it in place for nine months now. The one application we did not have on the hyperconverge was the one that you okay. chatted about, which is our class data set. Okay. So, so that was not, that was a separate server into itself. So this would prevent something like that from happening? Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. And Bill, where would you, where would the, you have a separate item for campus wireless. Where would the public wireless be? So the public wireless would be in hotspots that we have yet to define. Okay. But examples would be Memorial Park would be an oh, area. So just different parks. areas where residents uh, mingle, come together, we'd be able to put our hotspots out in that area so that we'd be able to have uh, Wi-Fi, internet connection. Interesting idea. Thank you. You bet. So, oh, Bill. So, with the increase in data allocations on most carriers, um, is there still a big need to have the free Wi-Fi all over the city? I mean, I can't, I can never use up my data, and I'm. So I'm as we sit here much. today, if you have a cell phone from AT and T, you do not have internet connectivity. So the carriers today don't saturate the entire environment. So there are still dead spots. So we'll be looking at that. And when you're looking at that carrier data, that's a data plan that you pay for. Our Wi-Fi will be more for to, to help that disparity, the economic disparity, so people that may not be able to have an unlimited data plan would be right. able to go to a park and be able to use our Wi-Fi at free of charge. So this is a different issue, but speaking of AT&T and this room, is I'll what, call what, is, happen up to ask that what is happening <laughs> with the um, tower sharing outside in the parking lot. My colleague, my esteemed colleague, uh, Public Works Director Borden, probably has a better answer. Than oh, okay. I do. Sorry. Yeah, wrong department. That's okay. Uh huh. Mr. Mosley, I presume. <laughs> Hi, Chad Mosley, City Engineer, not the Public Works Director. Um, AT&T is in the process of pulling building permits. Uh, they had some conversations and agreements with Verizon uh, in, when they were in the process of trying to get their equipment uh, permitted. Uh, with the Verizon uh, contract, there was, a, I think, a little bit of a slowdown there. And that had, had basically delayed the permitting of that, of that work. Uh, at t is about ready to pull permits, and we're still waiting for Verizon to get the, the treetop approved uh, before we can uh, let them begin work. We're hoping that's going to start sometime in the next three months. 
I remember when the iPhone first came out and Cupertino residents rushed out to buy it and realized in most of the city they couldn't even use it because it was only on AT&T. So now it's almost 11 years later, we still don't have AT&T coverage in this, you know, in the Civic Center area, which is really, you know, I just hope that gets fixed yeah, in my is, lifetime. Yeah, this is not uh, an issue that is city-oriented. This is something between AT&T and Verizon. All right, thank you. Chad? All right, so we have three sections left, um, and in the interest of uh, keeping uh, on time, we, we do have a 6 o'clock closed session to go to. Uh, prior to the regularly scheduled meeting at 6.45. Um, just to uh, apprise my fellow council members, we have three more sections. Uh, one's from Parks and Rec, which I believe is um, being put forward by Katie Nomira. Uh, and then there's another uh, section brought forth by Zach and Thomas. Uh, and then finally, we have capital improvement projects. And so we have a little bit more than an hour right now. And so what I'm gonna ask is that we consolidate our questions after each of these sections of the presentation. Um, and so, uh, Katie, if you could please uh, take away the next section. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. I'll be presenting the remainder of the um, departments. So for Recreation and Community Services, they're requesting $17 million. Uh, there has been an increase in salary and benefits, primarily due to negotiated salary and benefit increases, as well as increases in part-time staffing to support their accreditation process, expanding neighborhood programs, and uh, expanding team programming. Uh, materials is decreasing, mostly due to the reallocation of funds for the Senior Center Travel Program to contract services um, to more accurately uh, show where, where that is going. And then, in, so that explains the increase in contract services. Cost allocation is increased um, due to the reallocation of um, kind of one time IT project costs and a change in methodology as well as reallocation of library maintenance costs to recreation. Um, special projects is increased due to pro shop maintenance needs. Uh, contingency is decreased again uh, because of the 8% going down to the 5% of materials and contract services as well as other financing uses increasing slightly due to updated allocations of depreciated expenses. So this is the festivals chart that um, we kind of briefly went over. Um, so here are the festivals. There are 10 festivals that are planned this year, and this would include 86,000 in waived fees as well as 27,000 in city expenses. Um, and this does not include the Ikebana Festival because that occurs every other year. And then now we're moving on to planning and community development, which they're asking for about $9 million. And so salary and benefits is decreased slightly due to um, changes in how economic development has part-time staffing. Uh, materials is increased slightly due to the budget uh, reflecting ongoing costs of printing and duplication primarily. Contract services is reduced due to the economic development strategic plan being fully funded. Um, and cost allocations are increased uh, because the charges for facility uses, such as Community Hall and Quinlan, have increased and change in methodology for IT charges. Special projects is showing a reduction uh, due to the fact that the BMR budgeting uh, for the notice of funding availability, typically in the past we've budgeted the full $8 million that's available. However, there are a few applicants that come forth to claim those dollars. Uh, so we're choosing to take them uh, as they come in, uh, as opposed to budgeting them all up front. And then contingencies again are down uh, due to going from the 8% to the 5% and other financing uses are increased due to pass-through expenses and recovery costs to cover contracts and expenses for routine planning uh, review. In public works, they're asking for $34 million. Uh, there's an increase in salary benefits, partly due to negotiated increases, as well as the request for an engineering technician position and a part-time HR technician, as well as the reallocation of staff time. Materials is increasing due to the minimum wage increase of the janitorial contract, as well as tree and concrete work. Um, cost allocations 
or decreased due to a change in methodology, as well as decreased costs in vehicle and equipment replacement. Um, these are offset by other increases in the cost allocation program. Special projects is, has a reduction due to the completion of special projects. Um, contingencies are reduced, again, from the 8% to the 5% of materials and contracts. Financing uses are increased due to depreciation expenses, and capital outlay is showing a reduction due to the completion of projects as well as the movement of the annual sidewalk curb and gutter program to special projects. So here's um, the following, I believe, three slides show uh, the special projects, special one-time funding for public works, and for a total of $2,445,000. And I will pass this off to Zach to go over non-departmental. Okay, for non-departmental, um, we're seeing a $4.6 million decrease over the prior year adopted budget. Uh, this is primarily due to decreases in overall transfers. Um, this decrease, there's fewer transfers in fiscal year 1819 than there were in the previous year to uh, CIP and also um, to internal service funds uh, because of the, the fund consolidation to the general fund. Um, we want to point out here that this table does not include the capital reserve transfer out um, to CIP. The reason being is that it is included on the subsequent slide. So for capital improvement projects, and we'll be discussing this in greater detail when Director uh, Tim Borden takes over for the, for the CIP book, um, but overall a, a decrease in proposed expenditures of approximately $4.5 million, um, again, uh, related to significant progress and completion of projects in fiscal year 17-18. Okay, and due to, um, due to the timing of submission and also the completion and preparation of this budget document, there were three additional proposals that you will not be able to find in the published proposed uh, budget for fiscal year 18-19, and we wanted to bring these to your attention for your consideration um, and review. The first being community development uh, BMR linkage fees update in the amount of $175,000. This was actually part of the fiscal year 18-19 council work program. The second item is uh, for recreation and community services related to performing arts. And the total request um, is $82,000, and I'll talk briefly about those various components. Um, so this has to do with a uh, partnership with De Anza Visual Performing Arts Center, as well as um, SF Shakespeare, a community theater production company, uh, which will be putting on a, um, a production spanning over two weekends at a total cost of $45,000, as well as an additional $12,000 cost in facility rentals. Um, that $12,000 cost is associated with the De Anza Visual Performing Arts Center. And then there will also be um, $10,000 in part-time staffing to liaison and coordinate the logistics and marketing for that production. Finally, there is um, included in the $82,000 total, there's an additional $15,000 that may be used for potential additional uh, facility rental hours for youth and teen programs used um, use of the Performing Arts Center during fiscal year 18-19. And finally, the last item for public works um, is the Senior Mobility, the RIDE program in, a, in an amount of $22,000. This is the same level of funding as the prior year and unfortunately was not included in the base budget uh, rolling over between 1718 and 1819, so we are um, including it in this slide here. Okay, for fiscal year 2018-19 staffing requests, currently the city um, employs 199.75 uh, full-time employees and are recommending an additional uh, three new positions. And the first one is a risk manager. The risk manager will be improving the city's contracting and procurement process by not only managing the inherent liabilities involved in providing the municipal services, but also advising as to the appropriate types of um, types and levels of insurance on a contract to contract basis. The second position is a two year lit limited term senior management analyst. Um, this position is currently um, ensuring that current analytical and technical projects spanning over the last two years are carried out and completed in a timely manner. Um, it's all, the position is also currently working to develop and enhance the CalPERS retirement analysis 
various budget analysis, uh, development of budget book software or collective budget, and then also the integration of new software with the city's financial and human resources systems. Engineering technician is the third and final new position um, that you'll see on this slide. Engineering technician will be assuming um, already existing duties, but the purpose of the, of the addition um, will be to free up current staff to allocate more time for additional street maintenance projects and grant management, uh, primarily due to SB1 as well as Measure B. There are, you'll also see the two limited term uh, positions at the bottom, these are uh, being proposed to convert to permanent status. Uh, the first is an environmental programs assistant. And this position, um, this position uh, has become more essential to the sustainability division in performing duties related to greenhouse gas inventory data tracking, uh, climate action plan implementation tracking, program coordination, tracking various utility expenditures for and, and usage for energy. Uh, natural gas, waste, and also helping with community outreach and education. And the second and final uh, conversion from limited term to permanent is an associate civil engineer. I want to call out um, the dollar amounts are relatively limited and the reason being is that um, the current limited uh, contract is expiring in May of 2019. So what these requested dollars are for is really that last month of fiscal year 18-19. And this position will be um, to manage and assist with various new active transportation efforts included in the adopted 2018 pedestrian master plan, as well as the traffic impact fee development and the bicycle transportation plan implementation. And unless there are any questions, I will turn it over to Thomas, who will be discussing the issues and challenges. Um, I think this is actually probably a good time to consolidate our questions between uh, Katie's presentation and yours, Zach. So are there any questions from these last two? Vice Mayor Sinks. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so as I'm going through here, <clears throat> I'm computing the cost per attendee for these festivals. And I don't, you know, you can't simply look at that cost. Uh, per attendee, you also have to consider the value. So some of us might value, you know, um, the Veterans Memorial Program at $9.29 more than some of these others. It's relatively high. But I would appreciate when this comes back, right, if, if you could compute that for us so we can take a look at how mu what, what is the general fund or what are, what are the what are our what are our taxpayer dollars going to in terms of cost per estimated attendee? And if there's a range, so be it. So I, I have no problem, you know, thinking about some forms of participation being more than others. I would like to see in the the tournament of bands. Um, I think it makes sense to include not only the the people that the band members that are participating, but also the estimated crowd there. If you can do that. Okay. Uh, on one version of that, I, you know, it, so it's not apples to apples. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, c consider these community requests as they might be folded in and integrated would be my request. I don't know if that's the will of the rest of the council, but I, I would appreciate that the same kind of metrics applied to anything that okay. we would consider funding in partner, partnering effectively with these community organizations. So I wanted to ask you about uh, these these things that come in came in late. Um, uh, could you go back to that slide? The very last one, I think it was right. Yeah. So for the ride program, um, do you have data on how many residents have been served so far by the ride program? and how the, the relative breakdown of funding goes. My understanding is VTA's put in some, the county's put in some, we've put in some in West Valley Services and administer, is administering this in Campbell and in Cupertino. Yeah, Mr. Perkett, I don't know that we um, have their, their data back yet on how they're doing, but um, the structure you identified is the right structure. Well, I, I would certainly like to see the, 
I mean, I, I recognize that this is a pilot, and so it takes a long time for programs like this to get established and have roots. But I think we ought to look at, um, you know, how we're doing per ride, uh, and and then uh, also, uh, I will let you know that at the VTA PAC last week, uh, VTA staff indicated they may not be funding the ride program uh, again this year. So. If they don't, if they elect to opt out, I know Joe Samidian feels strongly about it, and we'd receive county funding anyway. But yeah, what would that mean to the program? And if VTA's share doesn't come in this next year, so West Valley Community Services did provide us with a presentation on how the pilot is going. So I'd be happy to share that with council. I don't know that we have time to do it now, but um, yeah, I don't think we have time. But I can sure I can definitely share the slide deck with council. I can email that out. Good, and then I think, and then getting to what this would look like if ETA drops, for example, if one of the partners doesn't Okay, we can certainly find that out. And our anticipation, you know, our forecast of how we might do next year is a, in a complete year. I mean, I appreciate the initiative. I think it's a good program, and I'm generally supportive of the idea. And then, yeah, the question is how are we performing, and what are we expecting for the next fiscal year? So that would be my request there. Yeah. Uh, just provide one quick data point. I don't have cost per ride, but I do have that they've, they've uh, in five months, almost 800 rides to almost 150 older adults. Right. And do you know how much per ride? No, I, I don't know how much per ride, but we can get that. Right. And, you know, I mean, I know you pay a different amount depending on if you're needs-based or not, right? So Correct. all of all of that, I think a review of, of this would be in order. Um, and Vice Mayor, if I may add, uh, yeah. there, there are also certain other uh, growing pains that the program is going through because yeah, yeah. If, if, a, if a medical facility is just outside the service area, it was not being covered and now uh, VTA and county has agreed to cover them. So there are yeah, certain yeah. things we are still, uh, and I, I still don't know that uh, this has come back to the VTA board for, for the next budgeting session, but from what I did understand, they were not even billed for the previous one. So. Uh, 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 I don't know. So, it's, yeah, it's just but, what came but that up with fiscal past, year is so. gone, um, and uh, for for the next year, I, I still need to check with the VTA yeah. board. As you know, I'm, I mean, I'm very supportive of this. I'm, I'm in the interest of transparency. I'm just looking for all these programs that we're working with partners on to see how we're doing in performing services for how many at what cost, right? So then, one more question uh, on this list: this eighty-two thousand dollars. Can you tell us? A little bit more about how many people would be served as participants in this production? I believe the initial estimate that we had discussed previously was approximately 30 students, or was it 50? 30. So if I divide 82,000 by 30, I get $2,733 per participant. Has this been vetted by our Parks and Rec Department? I will turn it right over. <laughs> Hi, Christine Hanel. And we do Assistant cost Director. recovery on both of these, on most of these kinds of programs, right? Right. So um, the idea was that the program would be open. It would be a theater program, so there would be approximately 30 participants, but there are 400 seats in the theater, so there would be um, filled by all the parents of the 30 participants. Well, family, friends, community. If there was a theater production that was that was presented, so um, I think the idea was that there would be a program in which parents would pay to register their child and those that would participate would then perform on the two weekends and those 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 productions would be open to the public um, I have a real problem with twenty two thousand seven hundred and thirty three dollars per actor child actor for for in this as a budget and I can't imagine that you would run this program in this way if you were if this was under your domain you can comment or not but i i'm right i'm astonished frankly that this would yeah show perhaps maybe we document. should um present the council with um the projected revenue which i don't have here in front of me but we would be selling tickets to to the performances as well to generate additional revenue well you're asking for a budget allocation of eighty two thousand mm -hmm. dollars which means That's the net of what we would collect in revenue according to this budget plan. Is that correct? 
Right. L let me um, go back and, and confirm with staff the numbers that were submitted. Um, I don't have those here today, but I'm happy to get those for you. I, I would like Thank to you. know. I would like to know what kind of performing arts will be performed. There was a desire to partner with um, San Francisco Shakespeare Festival. Um, they have assisted us before. We've contracted with them to provide services for children's theater. So I know that that was one of the ideas that was um, being discussed. Okay. I would like to get more detail so okay. you can provide it later, okay. not now. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy and, and to do that. Let me, let me just add some to it. And I, I thank Parks and Rec for going forward with it. Uh, and I'll also add, it seemed like you were talking about a certain number of uh, usages of the theater outside of the uh, performances, correct, in this $82,000 budget? I well, believe maybe, that was the intent. Right. Right, I would right. need to go back and look. I know right. that um, the director put the, the numbers together, and I would, I'll be happy to go back and confirm that, that information. Right, and I was just listening to the presentation, I think, by Katie with regard to the breakdown of the costs. It was like right. 45000 for... The program, twelve thousand for the room, you know, for the theater, um, and then some extra for you know extra days. Um, but just to give you some um, brief background on it, um, you know, I, I know that there is appetite from this council for community theater space, um, but there isn't much of a mechanism in our in our community, uh, especially through our parks and recreation program, uh, for 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 city sponsored uh, performance. And so um, I, I went ahead and uh, together with one of our um, fine arts commissioners um, went over to the Visual and Performing Arts Center uh, along with members of, uh, a member of uh, San Francisco Shakespeare Festival because I know that they have this type of program. Um, and, and I think Vice Mayor Sinks, I, I did mention it to you briefly uh, with the idea that you know, before we spend something like possibly 30 million, tens of millions of dollars on a performing arts center, uh, it, it might be good to, you know, at least uh, what the appetite of the community with regard to uh, performing arts. And so this was, you know, this isn't a personal um, kind of um, preference. Uh, it's not something that I want to, you know, go forward with. But like listening to my council and hearing that there was an appetite, um, you know, coming from from you know some some of the members for performing arts, you know, I thought this would be a relatively uh, less expensive way than putting in for the entire um, cost of uh, a visual performing arts center uh, like facility for the city of Cupertino. Um, but if there's no appetite for it, then you know, I, I'm more than happy to say, you know, look, you know, we could put it off to a, a different time or a different discussion. Um, but that was, that was purely my intent. And I'm glad that Parks and Rec went forward with it in terms of you know, a proposal that we could you know, potentially consider this year. Um, but again, you know, the genesis of it was uh, a couple of meetings that I took over at the, the Visual and Performing, uh, the Visual Performing Arts Center at De Anza College, because it is a good facility. Uh, it's it's very good for performing arts, and uh, you know, before we actually have that kind of, um, you know, ability to, to to take control of our own space in Cupertino, uh, i.e., build it out. You know, I think it would be good to have this kind of uh, mechanism to see what our community appetite uh, would potentially be. So, um, you know, it's, it's at the pleasure of uh, the council as to, you know, whether it goes forward. But I think, you know, relatively speaking, it's a, a pretty cost-effective way of exploring the, the general topic. Can, Can I you? ask you a few questions? Sure. Councilmember Chang. Katie, on the planning and the community development, mm -hmm. there's a uh, drop of the uh, special project, $8 million. And you mentioned about BMR application. What happened to it? Because the BNR application drop or because? Oh, okay. And so the community development special projects is about $8 million less because we offer $8 million in available funding for BMR projects. And no one um, applied for it? So what happens is in the past we have allocated the $8 million up front at the beginning of every year. Um, there have, haven't been very many applicants, and so as a result, we're choosing, or the department has chosen to go forth on a case-by-case -case basis and bring it forth to council and ask for the appropriation at that time. Okay. Do you know why? Can, do, you, do you have some hint as to why not, not many people are prized? I'll let the director of community <laughs> development speak to that. We've already got um, a director. Artisha Rastava, <laughs> assistant city manager. 
Um, you know, we've actually been in touch with um, the county with Measure A funds, um, charities, housing, mid-pen housing. Uh, we've even scouted out sites with them. Uh, but the problem really has been that the cost of land is so high and the number of units they get is not enough. We've even asked them to come forward with proposals to the council to see if the council had an appetite to look at a particular proposal. So okay. I think we went out three times last year, uh, one twice with Measure A, and we had no takers. Um, sometimes they offer, um, I think in a couple of instances, they offered what the seller was asking for, and the seller pulled out, said oh. he didn't want to sell it anymore. So it's been a little frustrating for them, um, but if there's anything, we'll bring it forward uh, to the council. Also, um, we wanted to note that um, annually a certain percentage of the housing planner and legal costs come out of that budget, so that entire $8 million is not available. We want to save a little bit for future years, uh, and we haven't seen a lot of development. Hopefully, as the fees go up, we'll actually see some. Uh, uh, so right now the pot's pretty stagnant after Apple. Okay. Um, Don't yes. go away. So I hope that answers. The uh, answer of some it, of it answers questions. part of his question because okay. I had the same question. Because every year you do send out a release, uh, the notice of uh, funding availability, correct? So let's say you do it again, and then at that point you do get requests. Where would these funds be? Um, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. I think we've talked to finance. One is we could put it back in, uh, and then put a certain amount aside for future administration. Or what we could do is say this much is available, and then we would come to the council anyway to fund the project. At that time, we could make a budget adjustment and put it in this year's budget. So it would come back to council for approval? Uh, it would have to come anyway okay. to the council for approval. Uh, uh, for example, when charities wanted to buy the Barry Swenson mm -hmm. site, um, it came to council Correct. authorization. Okay, thank you. Okay. My next question for Katie is public work. You mentioned there's a drop on the special project also. One point two. One point two million dollars. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about because completion of the special project. That's why. Yeah. It so it's a comparison of this fiscal year to last fiscal year. So last fiscal year we asked for about a million dollars more in special projects, and this year uh, we're not asking for quite as much. Okay. Um, I think we have. To you have anything else, Councilor Cheng? I had one question on yeah. additional proposals. Non-departmental, non um, there's a decrease of $4.58 million. Uh, you mentioned about due to the uh, overall transfer. Can you tell me a little bit more about what happened? So part of the transfers in previous years would come from the general fund. Or it would be a transfer from the general fund to capital reserve. Um, to fund various capital projects. Uh, because overall capital spending is decreasing in fiscal year 1819, the need for those uh, transfers from the general fund is also uh, decreasing. Okay. Um, part of, part of um, the, the decrease is also related to um, transfers from the general fund into internal service funds. And as far as in regards to the city's channel web fund that was moved to the general fund, that transfer was no longer needed on an annual basis. And that was just a few dollars, I believe, historically, approximately two to three to four hundred thousand um, dollars from the general fund to the internal service fund, but it is um, part of that variance. Okay. Now, this question for uh, David on the fiscal year 2018 to 19 staffing request. One is administration risk manager, right? Hundred and eighty thousand. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about it. So, um, our our contracting process has gotten more complex over the years, and so, um, uh, you know, with the interface between the departments and the city manager's office, um, and the need to get custom insurance for a lot of these contracts and activities that we do. Um, more and more we find the need for a specialist to, you know, basically keep the, the contracts moving. Specialists who understand the uh, contract better or uh, The contracting under the, process and understand understands the law better. It, and, and understands the insurance market and the, the kind of products out available in the market. and. 
um, the, the appropriate level of insurance for given activities. Um, okay. This this person would also manage our workers' comp program and some other programs that are currently done out of HR, but but it's sort of a burden on them. So this this position would take those over as well. Okay, I do get some feedback from the uh, city attorney's office. It's just sometime regarding the review of the contract, the department had are not responding fast enough to their request. Can you tell me? Well, the departments aren't experts in this area, so this is the reason is is because the you know the public works department and planning they don't they don't understand insurance. That's not their that's not their business, and so this particular manager that's their expertise. So they understand um, you know not necessarily an attorney. Often these people have training, maybe a uh, um, a paralegal or something, but they understand um, the liability issues and the insurance issues better than the departments do. Okay. The other, the second one is administrative, uh, administrative service senior manager, um, 170,000. What, what this person will be? Yeah, it's a limited term person. Um, uh, it's, so we're running out of Thomas's time. <laughs> uh, Thomas is, uh, a God, has been a godsend to administrative services in terms of making sure their systems are running properly and doing some really high level um, fiscal and accounting analysis. So this would this would keep him for another two years. Okay, all right. Uh, on the uh, performing additional proposal about the, the $82,000 for the performing art, uh, I'm in general for the performing art and I would like to ask the council and also the city looking into it, what are we going to do in the future, in the long term? What the city will do on the, especially on the art area, uh, what we would like to present as one of the famous art festival in in what kind? So, so, in ter so, so we're, yeah, we're, we'll be looking at a n number of things. For, first, um, as part of the parks master plan, we'll be looking at if, whether we want to do a physical facility someplace, uh, and then if if you would like, we could, I mean, then talk about programming. You know, what kind of what kind of programming we would we would do. Um, without a facility, we really can't program anything, obviously, because we don't have any, anywhere for people to perform um, outside of using the De Anza facility, which, which it's a good facility, but it is relatively expensive. Right, right, because, I, you know, I, we just finished G50 Global Smart City Summit. Uh, I received a bill from the Santa Clara Convention Center. It's $24,000 just yeah, yeah. for the rental for one day. It's pretty expensive, so. Right. And then there's pretty much there's no other space available, large enough to, to accommodate it. Right. Yeah, thank you. So on this slide, I want to add a proposal. It's just a placeholder because um, uh, Council Member Sharf and I have been going to several meetings for South Flow in airplane noise. While that uh, committee is going to be wrapping up pretty soon, the ad hoc uh, city associations uh, committee continues to meet, and there is a uh, placeholder request for about $25,000. And uh, we'll get more details later. Okay. Ready? Council Member Sheriff. Um, so for Parks and Rec, it was mentioned something about um, spending money on the pro shop. And I wondered how much money are we getting from the company that we contract out with um, who who sells the uh, tennis lessons to residents? I mean, are they paying us per year for that con as a franchisee, and do they run the pro shop and pay us for that as well? You mean golf lessons, not tennis lessons? No, I mean like lifetime tennis. The, oh, this is the this pro, pro shop. shop is the golf, is the okay, golf. so forget the pro shop for for that. I, I'm asking about at the sports center. Are we paying or receiving money from that, from Lifetime Tennis? We, we, we net money from that, so that's a money maker for the, for the department. Okay, and okay, the next changing gears, the festivals. So I notice on some of the festivals, we have a range of attendance, and some of them, we have just an approximate attendance. So how, how has this been counted? Where on some of them, it's 3,000 to 5,000, the other one, it's definitely 5,000. But it's approximate. Yeah, they're, they're all estimates. I think the sheriff gives us some basic numbers. Sometimes the, the operators will provide us numbers. They're very 
uh, it's pretty hard to, you know, unless you have a, a gate or someplace, it's hard to actually do an accurate count. And oh, these are all free. <laughs> yeah, or and we can borrow free. the sheriff's helicopter. Um, so for tournament of bands, since I was involved with that for many years and still am actually, um, as council member Sinks pointed out, it's not just the band members. There's a huge number of people in the stands, pro actually more than the band members. So our, um, one of our bike peg commissioners who was chair of that the last time it happened could provide an estimate. Actually, she could provide exact attendance because she knows how many tickets were sold. And they don't give away tickets to anybody, even to uh, babies. Um, and then one issue that always came up with that was the amount of money that they had to spend to hire um, off-duty sheriff's deputies. Now, I see these other festivals, the city is paying for that, but for TOB, um, they're not paying for that. Is there any way that we, we could pay for it? Um, I don't know if it's not there because the, the turn of advance pay for it or for the sheriff cops it. Some, some of these are sheriff uh, cops. Oh, no, they, yeah, they don't comp this one. I know, well, last year, TOB was canceled because of the uh, Napa fires. Okay. So I don't know if that's why it's not there, but I think they actually have to pay that every year out of the, um, the ticket revenue. So if these other festivals are getting it paid for, it would seem like um, they should also qualify for that because it's quite a few closed off streets on that day. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm sure they, uh, they haven't requested it, but if they want to request it, that's certainly... I, think, I, I mean, I concur with Stephen. I mean, we ought to be rationalizing all of this and if we're getting law enforcement services from the sheriff for some and not others we ought to be thinking we ought to be thoughtful about how we I mean it depends also on the applicant but right I think other than so the Harris run is actually the sheriff's own right uh, so that's activity comp, so they comp that yeah. every and then I think Veterans Day they don't pro they don't provide um, security or anything for, for that so the other ones I think they do they do charge mostly for um, for you know, parking enforcement, closing okay. streets, and things like that. All right, and then finally for RIDE, R-Y-D-E, I would just be interested in how much the subsidies are versus the number of rides, if it would be better to subsidize a service like Lyft or Uber instead of this. I know the RIDE drivers don't get paid, and it would seem like we're spending more um, than it would cost to use a private service. I know it's still a pilot, and maybe the usage will increase um, and I mean it sounds like a great program but I just would like to look into the cost effectiveness of, uh, of that especially if the county is pulling out or VTA is pulling out of providing funding and let's see uh, I guess that's all thank you okay excellent so um, at this point let's um, bring up Thomas for your part of the presentation and then our public works director um, has a presentation on CIP. Uh, we're about at half an hour left. I do have one blue card, so I want to just apprise everyone that uh, we'll spend a few mon minutes on uh, that commentary. Um, but uh, Thomas, please uh, continue the presentation. And uh, again, we'll consolidate your uh, questions from your presentation uh, with Director Borden's uh, questions or, or, or questions to uh, the two of you uh, into uh, one unit after both of these presentations. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. I'll be discussing I issues and challenges currently facing the city. The first issue I'll be discussing is retirement costs. So Cupertino, like most California cities, provides retirement benefits for its employees through the uh, California Public Employees Retirement System, also known as CalPERS. As we explained in previous presentations, poor investment returns during the Great Recession, as well as assumption changes, have increased the gap between the pension assets and pension liabilities, resulting in the overall funded status of the pension program falling significantly. As a result, the CalPERS Board adopted revised actuarial policies in order to increase the financial sustainability of the pension system. Two significant changes were the discount rate decreasing from 7.5% to 7% in December 2016, as well as the amortization period for new pension liabilities changing from 30 years to 20 years, starting in July 2019. 
Both of these changes will result in significant increases to our retirement costs. And it is important that the city be prepared for potentially lower investment returns, given that most analysts see the potential for greater macroeconomic uncertainty and volatility going forward. As a result, the fiscal year 2019 proposed budget includes and projects these additional pension costs, as well as proposes the creation of a pension rate stabilization program, or Section 115 Trust, which will serve to stabilize pension rate volatility in order to have a less severe impact on our operating budget going forward. And there will also be an additional item at the regular council meeting this evening to propose the establishment of a Section 115 Trust. So I'll go into a lot more detail at that time. In addition, though, budget-wise, to address rising retirement costs, the city is taking the following measures. One is limited term positions, two is a signed CalPERS reserve, and three is a Section 115 Trust as a pension rate stabilization program. So the proposed budget only recommends funding for permanent positions where there's a permanent need or ongoing revenues can completely support that position long term or if staff cannot recruit or retain staff on a limited term basis. This is because we are still unsure you know, what CalPERS will do with the discount rate going forward and so we want to minimize any ongoing costs. In addition, the city has been fiscally conservative and built up large reserves. In the past, we've already assigned reserves to an assigned CalPERS reserve. In this year's budget, we propose increasing that reserve to $8 million. This will set aside funds for retirement costs and based on a 20-year projection should allow the city to weather any potential increases to employer retirement rates while minimizing any impacts to our budget. In conjunction with that, we propose a Section 115 trust. That is one of the options. So. If the Section 115 Trust is approved, the funds for that Section 115 Trust would come from the assigned CalPERS Reserve. And the other issues that we have going forward are revenue volatility and health benefits. So the city's revenue mix is heavily reliant on business to business or B2B sales tax. And B2B sales tax currently makes, about, makes up about 19% of our revenues of our general fund revenues. As a result, our revenue is very sensitive to any economic fluctuations, and this was also our experience during the economic downturn during 2000 to 2004. Our heavy reliance on the volatile high-tech industry also makes us vulnerable. In particular, our two largest taxpayers, our, our sales taxpayers are both technology companies. So far, you know, our projections look pretty good because most forecasts are projecting uh, moderate growth going forward, but this is definitely something to be concerned about. In addition, our transient occupancy tax is also highly related to economic fluctuations as it's primarily driven by business travel. To address this volatility, the city has been promoting its general retail sector, including promoting businesses such as the Main Street development. In addition, regarding health benefits, there is uncertainty around the potential repeal or replacement of the Affordable Care Act and how it would affect health care costs going forward. Since the implementation of the Affordable Care, Act, Affordable Care Act, health care costs have stabilized. As a result, staff will be monitoring any legislation related to the ACA so that the city can take any proactive measures if required. I'll now discuss the next steps with regard, with regard to the budget. So this evening we're going to be having the third quarter report for fiscal year 1718. In addition, we'll have the CIP presentation right after my current presentation. And on June 5th, we'll have a budget hearing and adoption, and we'll come back to you in November 2018 with our first quarter report. If you would like to access the budget, you can access it online at our city website. As well, you can access it on our transparency portal, OpenGov, and view copies at City Hall or at the Cupertino Library. This concludes our budget presentation, and the budget team and any department directors are available if you have any questions. And now I'll hand it over to Director Borden to present the Capital Improvement Program budget. Thank you, Thomas. Welcome, Director Borden. Thank you.
Okay, so I will go through this very, very quickly. I'll, I'll kind of shortcut uh, my, my program here and leave it more to questions at the end, but, but I, will, uh, I will go through the slides just, just quickly. Um, first, I want to talk about uh, completed projects from, from this current year. Uh, we've, you know, we've done a lot. We've gotten a, a lot of ADA improvements in, Jollyman Park and Varian Park. Uh, we've done studies, International Cricket Ground Study. We've, we've completed the fiber network extension from the Senior Center to the Service Center on Mary Avenue. Um, done the conceptual planning, a lot of community outreach uh, with gardeners to come up with a, uh, a community garden plan. Um, the retaining wall replacement on, on Regnart Road, that was an emergency uh, uh, project. Senior Center walkway replacement, the Sports Center um, tennis court light upgrades, storm drain improvements on Foothill Boulevard and Cupertino Road, where we had had flooding uh, um, just several years ago. Um, com you know, nearly complete our storm drain master plan, and, and we've completed now the, uh, all of the tennis court resurfacing in the various parks throughout the city. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about why do public improvement projects cost so much? I mean, get to ask that a lot, but I just want to make sure that we're talking apples and apples and understand what all goes into these budget, budget amounts. Um, so a lot of times you'll hear from a contractor or a developer that, that a project costs a certain amount, and we want to just kind of put that, that number in perspective with what it really costs with a fully loaded um, public project. So, so in addition, uh, additional requirements for public projects, we have you know, environmental clearance, qualification-based consultant selection, um, extensive stakeholder and community outreach, which sometimes involves redesigns, um, our project delivery process, the, the uh, bid and advertising process, um, greater accountability in that we also act as the owner of our projects to make sure that quality control is above just code minimums. And then we uh, you know, also pay um, prevailing wage on all of our contracts. Uh, sorry, let's see. Um, so if, if we start with what it really costs for the labor and material for a project, so let's just say it's $80,000. Um, these, are, these are costs that get given to us as part of the bid, but the contractor's costs also include site requirements, job site management, insurance and bonds, overhead and profit, and escalation at, at approximately 3% per year. And so let's say that, that adds up to a total of $100,000. Then you take that $100,000, and for our budgeting process, we, we have a design contingency just because we don't know the scope of a project when we're at this stage uh, of, of, of work. We don't know what's, what's going to be included, what unforeseen conditions there might be, and what, what changes in the scope could occur. Um, there's construction contingency that we have at 10 to 15 percent at this point, uh, again, not knowing the scope of the project. And then so that brings you to a subtotal for construction. Then uh, you have your consultant design, uh, city project management on top of that, um, construction management where we, where we come in to, to actually hire consultants that do the day-to-day -day, um, inspection and construction management. Um, testing and inspection of materials on a project, and then you come up with your your eighty thousand dollar you know just labor and, and construction cost up to about one hundred eighty five thousand dollars. So this is just an example, but I just want you to know what all is included at this point in a project. Um, this is just a, just a, a representation. What I'm really looking for is is to show the shape. What we call this is really the cone of the unknown. So if you start over on the, on the left side of the graph here, that's when we're at the stage where we are right now where we have a project where we really don't have a defined scope yet. Um, we know that we want to do, we want to build something, but we don't know what, what exactly that is. As you progress into conceptual design, schematic design, design development, then construction um, drawings, and then to bid, you're going to know more and more what that scope is. There's going to be less and less unknowns, and that cone gets narrower and narrower, so then your contingencies become smaller. So sometimes when we're at this stage, we're using very large um, contingencies uh, on top of, of what we estimate the actual um, construction cost to be. So, so anyway, thank you for indulging me there. Just I, I think it's important to, to understand that. Um, 
looking at the priorities for our projects, a lot of our projects the last few years have been really just follow-ons on ad adopted master plans. So we completed our, our bicycle transportation plan, our pedestrian plan, our storm drain master plan. Projects come out of, the, out of those plans, prioritized, and get into the, into the CIP. Um, as well as, you know, we, we anticipate in future years we'll have projects coming out of the citywide um, parks master plan that will roll into the CIP. Okay, just to keep moving here. Now I'm gonna, I, what I'm going to do just for time um, savings here is I, I'm only going to um, first start off by showing you the 13 projects that we um, that would be new projects into the budget at this time. I will hold off on going into all of the projects that were already budgeted uh, and and discussing those. And I'll just open those for questions. So so looking at uh, new new projects for, for this uh, coming year. The Blackberry Farm Entrance Road improvements, this is with the acquisition of the, of the Seifert property, doing a feasibility study to look uh, to ways to get uh, safer pedestrian and bicycle access down into Blackberry Farm. Um, the citywide building condition assessment, so we, we are, that, that project is ongoing, um, reaching conclusion. Um, what it is showing us is, is that, that we need to, to program maintenance of a lot of our facilities, kind of like we, we dug into our street maintenance program several years ago. If we don't start maintaining these a assets and putting cycle, cycle time um, improvements into some of the systems, we're gonna end up with, with um, lack of service that, that we'll be able to provide and, and likely more expensive um, repairs in the, in the long run. Um, Creek infall outfall restoration. There's there's several locations, three locations with this project where we are having to do a lot of maintenance annually because of debris and sediment that is flowing down to, into um, creeks that are not water district maintained. These are maintained by the city. So so we're doing some work upstream um, and at the the location of the outfall on those locations. De Anza Median Island landscaping phase two. So so. Um, we, uh, as early as possibly next Monday, work would start on phase one, which is from Bollinger up to Rodriguez. This would be on the north end, would be phase two, which would be uh, um, 280 down to Mariani. And really what the, what the project consists of is, is taking the, the bermed or the, or the mounded uh, median island down to grade, um, rebuilding the arbors with, with uh, metal, uh, metal material, um, installing LED lighting on those arbors and uh, putting in new irrigation systems um, and then uh, drought, drought um, resistant materials. Lawrence Mitty Park Master Plan, of course this is contingent on, on uh, the acquisition of the property and the annexation of the property to, to the city, but we are pro pro proposing for the budget to start the master plan process if that does come to be. Uh, the community garden I mentioned uh, in our accomplishments that so we've we've completed uh, the community outreach and the design for that but this so this would be going in and doing the reconfiguration really the rebuilding of the garden plots um, improving accessibility to the plots redoing the irrigation the the power uh, the the EEC aquatic habitat upgrade this is, uh, you know, a lot of people are calling it a turtle pond. I think it's fish as well. But this would be um, on, on the, right near the Environmental Education Center. And it would, a lot of the project is getting access um, to, that, to this, this new facility for school kids and anyone else that will be visiting the facility. Regnart Road improvements, when we went in and did the, the emergency repair, when we had the, the, the landslide, we did a further analysis to see where our risks were and found that there are some, uh, mostly due to drainage needs on the up, upside of the, uh, of the roadway. So this goes in and, and does, does some of the repairs on a more proactive basis on Regnart Road. Um, we did extensive walk audits with the schools uh, this year. This project would go in and, and do some of the items on those walk audits. A lot of it is, is at their drop-off pickup locations. It may be new crosswalks. It may be flashing beacons. 
um, and and really making you know implementing some of the things that that the schools put a lot of time and effort into. Stevens Creek Boulevard and Banley uh, signal upgrades. This is to go into that that intersection and and providing protection for the phases for uh, pedestrians and bikes. So uh, right now it is those those movements are shared with with uh, the ve vehicular movements so that that separates them. The class four walkway installation. Uh, this would be going in and actually doing the um, the construction for the first phase of the class four bikeway installation on um, Stevens Creek. We we just entered into the engineering contract to do the construction drawings, and uh, so we anticipate that that you know we will be able to get to construction for that first phase this year. Storm drain master plan implementation. I mentioned that is almost complete. Um, likely, you know, we have two or three projects that may rise to the top, but this would this would take and start and start uh, really at the top start at the top of the priority list when that uh, when that storm drain master plan is complete. Streetlight replacement citywide. There there are um, some of the the streetlight poles in the city are becoming corroded and need replacement. We've done a lot. We, we've ordered all of the poles. We've done a lot of the, the work internally, but there's 50, 55 locations where there are overhead conflicts with power lines. Um, so really involves a different expertise. And so this project would go in and, and, and do those replacements. And uh, with that, it w would be going into um, projects that are already funded or need some additional funding. So I, at this point, I'll just stop here and, and ask if there's any questions. Hey, thanks, uh, Tim. Any questions? Vice Mayor Sinks. Do we have a copy of the slides that you just presented? I mean, I have the first ones, but they sort of run out after. The black and white one. I have the, yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Yes. Good, thank you. That that'll do it for the moment. All right, great. Uh, any other questions? So, is there anything that you'd like to highlight? You know, maybe two or three items uh, that are outside of the. I know it's a forty-nine page, uh, you know, presentation. Uh, any highlights that you'd like to cover um, in those other? 30 or so pages that that that, that got uh... let's see I think uh, the, the, so I will um, I'll mention sports center upgrades um, we we are uh, taking really four different improvements at the sports center put it rolling those into to one project um, so we've taken different budgets put them together into into one project so that we can minimize disruption at the uh, at the sports center when we do this but it is renovating restrooms renovating uh, the women's locker room the men's locker room and shower um, as well as the uh, renovating the front lobby so that's that's uh, probably worth noting um, let's see what that, that's I think that that's you know I think that continued bike plan implementation. So so you know we're we're not asking for additional budget, but we you know we got mid during the year this year we got the additional 1.8 million from Apple. We did the mid-year budget allocation for the Carmen Road study, so we'll we'll begin on that as well. We anticipate um, this coming year that that with um, SB1 and Measure B, we'll be applying for more grant money for these programs. Our pavement report that you'll hear tonight um, is is really that our, our pavement condition index is at a level that we're able to apply for other type of improvements in Measure B and SB1, such as bike pet improvements. It doesn't have to be just pavement maintenance. So, so you know, that we'll continue to be aggressive um, in implementing that plan as well as the pedestrian master plan. Okay, very good. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, Council um, Chair. So can we get money from for the Regnart Trail from measure from any of those measures, measure A or B? Very likely. I think all of our trails will be, in, you know, once we've done the, um, the, the design drawings, I think they'll be in a good position for, for grant possibilities. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, Director Borden, I do have one uh, blue card from the, the public. 
and uh, that regards this item. Uh, the subject uh, states Deer Hollow, and it's from Jennifer Griffin. Welcome, Jennifer. And as usual, it's three minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I always learn a lot coming to these meetings. I didn't really, I did take statistics in school, but I didn't do a lot of business stuff, but I've learned a lot from watching these. Um, I want to just give a shout out for several items. You all discussed Deer Hollow. Um, this, the people from Deer Hollow have been coming regularly to the city for probably the last 10 years asking for additional money. And uh, there have been times where they have brought in statistics about how many children had gone. I think it was when, um, I believe that um, uh, Gilbert Wong's children had actually gone there. This was a couple years ago. Actually, personally, one of my set of nieces and nephews from one of the brothers actually went to summer. Uh, they went to a week-long camp there, each one of them. They're three or four years apart. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Deer Hollow is you get a lot of bang for your buck. It is one of the most raw and pure historical sites that we have. I was at San Juan Batista last Friday with my family members, and to me, in terms of San Juan Batista, that is one of the most pure historical sites that you can get for the history of California in this area. Um, in terms of um, Deer Hollow Park, it was a working farm. It, from 1860, Grant, the Grant family that Grant Road is named from were the ones that established it in the 1860s. Um, they were uh, very, very instrumental in uh, farming that area. It was a working farm up until the point when Midpin purchased the property, and I believe it was the eight, late eight, 1980s, but it had been a working farm. I went on a tour of it as a grade school child when it was actually a working farm with the original owners there. Um, so I'm just saying, if anybody wants to get a pure historical experience of what farming in early California was, you go there. Um, and that's why they are, they're using um, one of the barns is actually from 1880 that is in use as a, it's, it's currently day to day in use. I mean, all you have to do is go in there and look at the, the architecture, et cetera, and you know what time period. There are buildings there from the original homestead from 1865. Um, this is like 10 years after California became a state. This is, in, this is what was going on in the West Coast while the Civil War was being fought in the eastern part of the United States. So I'm just saying, if I could, I would give them $100,000. It is absolutely, and the orchard, I mean, it, what happens is that you walk onto that site and you're enmeshed in history. And you don't need a lot of, of science, I'm sorry, you don't need a lot of things to get the historical experience. Give them money. Yes, please, um, Lawrence Mitty Park, we need that really bad. And the other thing I was gonna shout out was Stoffelmeyer House, let's preserve it. I want it to be like Los Altos' his history house and also like the farm at Bedeer Hollow. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll bring it back up here briefly. Uh, we do have closed session in about five minutes, but if there are any um, final comments, uh, I think we've given a fair degree of input uh, into this budget study session to staff at this point, but if there are any other final comments, I'd uh, be happy to entertain any. Seeing none, let's adjourn to closed session and we'll start the council meeting at 6.45. Thanks very much.